welcome and uh, thank you for watching. I, my name is uh, Katarzyna Wodniak. I, I am a sociologist and assistant professor at uh, SAN and also an associate, um, honorary research associate at Trinity College Dublin, where I also I did my PhD. And uh, today I'd like to introduce you to uh, disaster management. Uh, this is a topic that is, uh, that is particularly uh, timely these days uh, because of the uh, because of a biological uh, disaster that we are facing uh, of an unprecedented uh, scale, and um, it makes the topic more interesting because a lot of theoretical concepts can uh, can be directly. Uh, illustrated uh, by uh, examples that, that we uh, get from the news every day. Uh, so I'm going to share the slides with you. Uh, so we're going to start with a little bit of history. Uh, so disasters have affected humans uh, since we appeared on uh, on Earth, uh, and I, obviously in the past it was a, at a much smaller scale uh, than uh, than these days, <clears throat> and responses uh, varied. I, and they were I, the attempts to decrease exposure, I, developing ways I, to uh, to decrease the impact, to address the impact. I, they obviously I included uh, post disaster or during the disaster response and post disaster uh, recovery. And all of all of these different activities, I had uh, one goal: so, uh, disaster management. Disaster management as a discipline uh, is uh, relatively new, but like I said, I, the the disasters always uh, took place. I when we look at the ancient history. A, a very interesting example is a, a group of say, scholars <clears throat> in, uh, in Mesopotamia I, around I, the year 3200 uh, before Christ. I, and they were a group of, um, th they were a group that others in the society would come to uh, whenever they, uh, they faced a kind of a hazard or a, or a problem, and uh, what Asipu uh, did is basically what uh, disaster management uh, managers uh, do uh, these days. So they would analyze uh, events and details, uh, propose different alternatives, uh, which would be like risk uh, 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 risk assessments and uh, and alternatives, then uh, give outcomes for each of these alternatives, and then this was weighed, weighted, uh, and I served uh, the society. And then an example that uh, most people are familiar with are her uh, the, uh, the cities of Herculaneum and Pompeii, uh, cities that were at the foot of uh, Vesuvius uh, volcano, uh, and two very different responses. Uh, Herculaneum uh, were closer to the volcano and they were uh, the, the city was completely destroyed. Uh, Pompeii managed to organize uh, their communities and evacuate to uh, many people and uh, even though the city itself uh, was destroyed, they, they managed to save a lot of lives. Uh, and uh, then examples of more uh, systematic uh, way of trying to uh, address disasters, uh, and they could be they could be traced to uh, past civilizations. Uh, so we have examples of Babylon or Egypt, uh, Rome, and the uh, 
civilization of Incas. So in Egypt, for example, uh, every year <coughs> there was a <coughs> There was a great uh, flood of uh, the Nile, uh, and because it was recurring, the pharaohs uh, at some point decided to um, to come up uh, with solutions, and uh, they uh, created these uh, water uh, water wheels. The the first uh, picture shows uh, an example of such a wheel. Uh, and not only they managed to control uh, the floods, but they, uh, because of this irrigation uh, system, they, they managed to, uh, to distribute water to their, uh, to their fields and they improved uh, farming this way. Uh, so that, that's, uh, that's one of really uh, great examples. And then there is an example of ancient Rome. Uh, around uh, 2,000 years ago, there was a great fire uh, of Rome, uh, and uh, as a <clears throat> as a reaction to this fire, <coughs> uh, the uh, the powerful in Rome decided that uh, they need an organized service, uh, and they started training. Uh, mostly soldiers uh, initially anyway uh, and they created a professional uh, fire brigade uh, and these were operating for 500 years uh, un until the dawn of uh, Roman uh, Empire and then this kind of service disappeared for a, for a thousand years uh, so you could see uh, the examples of quite I, quite a sophisticated and um, and systematic way of addressing disasters, but even though uh, th these efforts were organized, they were either uh, limited to a specific hazard, like the example of Pompeii uh, that I talked about uh, here, uh, or they were systematic uh, and quite comprehensive, but within single actions. So in, uh, in the example of Egypt, uh, it was uh, the flood, uh, so it's a, a single event that would happen every year. In Rome, uh, it, was, uh, it was the fires. And then if we're talking about, uh, about modern responses, I, we're talking about the period after uh, after the Second World War, and uh, this was this was a period when uh, where uh, when many uh, public services uh, were developed and organized, uh, and disaster management uh, was uh, one of them, uh, and. Uh, in most countries, uh, these systems uh, started to develop after, uh, after specific uh, events. And because there were uh, resources in place from, from the uh, period of, uh, of the wartime. Uh, and b because the war was the time when uh, these elaborated and uh, sophisticated systems of civil defense uh, were uh, first um, uh, created, and this is this included uh, detection systems, warning uh, warning alarms, uh, shelters, uh, certain rescue teams, uh, local and regional uh, coordinators, uh, certain uh, legal frameworks. So all these provided kind of ready tools uh, for uh, organizing uh, the disaster uh, management. Uh, and what also changed was the uh, shift in thinking. Uh, so uh, these were the changes that were happening uh, at the time uh, anyway. Uh, the increased responsibility or the perception of uh, responsibility of the government. Uh, 
I, and I, one of these roles was uh, preventing, managing, responding, and recovering after disasters. I, so as a discipline, I, disaster management and um, national emergency management systems I started to uh, become uh, more centralized uh, throughout the 1970s and uh, 1980s. And this was a period when, I, when local, uh, regional and national level uh, emergency management systems uh, would uh, emerge. And then uh, from the 90s, we're going to talk about it in a, mi in a minute, I, we can start talking about international uh, disaster management. I, so, I, in, like I said before, in, in the case of many countries, I, these systematic approaches, I, they, I, they spurred from, I, from certain disasters and the criticism I, around them. I, so, so a combination of factors, I, so resources in place, the awareness, I, the growing capability, um, the, the society's uh, criticism and expectations. I, but we also have to remember that there are some I, countries in, uh, around the world that still don't really have I, the real uh, emergency management structures. Uh, so when, when we're talking about uh, international disaster management, uh, this developed over the years and uh, one of the first efforts uh, was by the UN, uh, which in 1987 um, announced an international decade for natural disaster reduction. And this was the decade, the decade of uh, 1990 to uh, 1999. And then uh, other documents uh, followed and the UN uh, role in, in this whole process was really, really important. Uh, so in 1994, there was a Yokohama strategy uh, and plan of action. Uh, then International Strategy for Disaster Reduction in 2000s, as well as uh, Hyogo uh, Framework for Action. Uh, and uh, the way of thinking uh, started at the time, that it's not enough to, to just respond, uh, even though that's really, really important, uh, and uh, to be able to recover after a disaster, uh, but also uh, that it's possible to mitigate hazards and mitigate risks and to be prepared. Uh, so the world's international disaster management organizations, agencies and interest group were shifting from, uh, from just response to also prevention through mitigation and, uh, and through uh, preparedness. And I, this is what, what drives disaster management uh, these days. It's a four-phase approach. Like I said, I, the, um, uh, the activities that governments I, and, I, and say local or re, uh, regional services I can take beforehand uh, in terms of mitigating and being prepared for certain disasters and then response and recovery. Uh, so uh, the four-phase four approach uh, includes mitigation, preparedness, response, uh, and recovery. Uh, and then uh, because uh, disaster management started to be uh, approached more systematically, uh, also more research uh, surfaced, I, and way more is available I, these days from, I, from different disciplines uh, because that, that's quite important when we talk about uh, disaster management as well, that it's a very interdisciplinary uh, discipline. I, so we need experts from a lot of different fields to be able to understand 
uh, what disasters are, what ha what hazards uh, societies are uh, exposed to, what are the risks, uh, risks, how they can be mitigated and prepared for, assessed, uh, etc. Uh, and there is a certain scholarship on uh, on disasters over the years, and when we're talking about trends, uh, there are five main tre uh, trends. Uh, so more and more people are affected by disasters uh, as we go, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are less uh, fatalities. Uh, then disasters are becoming more and more expensive. Uh, it is the poor countries that are suffering uh, more from the consequences. Uh, and the number of disasters is increasing uh, every year. And here you can, you can see that uh, in the graphs. Uh, so you can see uh, the peak kind of uh, around 2003 since then. A slight decrease, but uh, in the number of people affected, uh, which uh, could be uh, because in time we're learning how to deal with these disasters, at least uh, some of them if they are recurring. Uh, so it's possible to some extent to reduce vulnerability. So we can't really reduce what, what disasters we are exposed to, but well, very often we can't, sometimes we can. I, but even with the disasters that we can't do anything about, I, it's possible to reduce, like I said, uh, vulnerability. So the number of people affected, I, um, even though it's rising in the, in the, uh, in the last years, I have been slightly decreasing. But you can see a huge difference between like the, uh, be, between um, mid 1960s to uh, 2010, and we can observe right now what is happening: the scale of a disaster and how many people are affected, and in so many uh, so many different ways. So not only health-wise, this is a biological disaster what we are facing now, Corona. I, but also I, economically and socially and politically. I, here you can see I, the number of fatalities over the years. Um, so fewer people I, are dying from disasters. I, then we have I, the fact that disasters are becoming more and more expensive. And this uh, it has to do uh, with uh, the development of technology and infrastructure. So because what we, the structures that we come up with are more and more sophisticated, then recovering them after disasters uh, is just more expensive. Uh, then the fact that poor country, countries are uh, more affected uh, by disaster consequences. Uh, the, the reason uh, for that, uh, well, there are many, uh, but one of the important ones are, uh, is the fact that um, even though it, it's the environment degradation, uh, and uh, even though the countries in the north are more responsible for this, it is the countries in the global south uh, that feel the, uh, the consequ consequences more uh, severely. Another reason is that uh, poor countries usually don't have the same uh, resources, they don't have the same level of emergency management uh, services in place. Therefore, it's uh, more difficult uh, to, to recover. It's, um, it might be a bit slower uh, in terms of respond, uh, response, but also obviously uh, mitigation and, uh, and preparedness. If there are no resources, you wouldn't be able to mitigate or, or prepare as well. And then the fact that there are more and more disasters uh, happening. So, I, there, there have been periods throughout the history when I, there were more disasters. Uh, 
I, but here it seems uh, almost certain that I, the fact that there are more of these disasters is um, th th that is because of, of uh, human activity. Uh, so the reason for that would be anthropogenic. And this is when, it, when we talk about uh, the so-called natural disasters. I, a lot of them uh, could be uh, caused by, uh, for example, the global warming. I, sometimes it's because of, um, a, of uncontrolled uh, urbanization, for example. I, but mostly the, the environment uh, degradation. And then when we talk about um, techno technological uh, hazards and technological uh, disasters, obviously there would be more of them because, uh, because we, we live with more and more uh, technologies. I, so there are a few uh, concepts uh, in disaster management that uh, really need to be defined and uh, clarified and generally this is a uh, this is a discipline uh, where a, a lot of it uh, comes to this for, to, to clarifying to, to systematizing because uh, unless this is done uh, hazards can't really uh, be addressed uh, properly uh, so hazards are um we are confronted with many of them although very often it's just uh, our uh, perception because i we i we are the the hazards that we are actually exposed to are uh, to a large extent depending on uh, on our our physical location uh, the the disaster that we're facing now, I, that's of an unprecedented scale with how, I, how widely I, it affects uh, society around the world. I, the truth is that whatever we do, we are facing some degree of risks. And then it's the hazards that are the source of that risk. Uh, and uh, when it comes to natural hazards, I, actually all kinds of hazards, like I said, the physical location would be the primary factor. Uh, and then when it comes to technological and intentional uh, type of hazards, uh, it's the economic, industrial and uh, social, social political factors uh, that determine them as well as the uh, physical uh, location. Uh, so when it comes to hazards, uh, their individual and national perspective uh, and uh, the global awareness of hazards is, is uh, thanks to the media and the globalized economy. Uh, but like I said, most of them uh, have no impact on, uh, on the uh, individuals. I, but then uh, it's it's really possible. It's really important to understand in in a particular physical location what are the hazards. Uh, so they must be identified and they must be uh, analyzed. And uh, there are certain methods uh, to to do that. Uh, so identifying what hazards uh, we're facing uh, and where exactly uh, is the first step in disaster management and this process identifies uh, all the hazards that, uh, that, that uh, the particular location experienced in the past uh, and uh, assessing the likelihood of uh, this kind of um, hazard again occurring in the future uh, and uh, it's it's the job of uh, of a disaster manager to identify all the possible hazards, regardless uh, of likelihood and often the consequences, because it's really important to have a, an exhaustive list of what possible hazards uh, there could be. 
Uh, but this is only the first step. And based on the, on the identification of hazards, uh, risks are assessed. So that would, uh, that would come next. Uh, and what is also important is to realize that uh, not only primary hazards, should be identified, uh, but that a lot of um, hazards have secondary hazards or even tertiary uh, hazards that, uh, that happen after them. Uh, an example, the most spectacular example, uh, would be Japan in 2011 when uh, there was an earthquake first, uh, followed by a tsunami, uh, followed by a flood, and this flood um, affected the nuclear power plant and caused a, a nuclear uh, explosion as well. So you have uh, one primary disaster, which was the earthquake, and then three disasters uh, that followed. And it's, uh, it's the job of the disaster manager uh, to make sure that all these hazards uh, are identified and that there is a risk assessment um, conducted against all of them. Uh, so what comes after identifying hazards is hazard analysis, uh, which is called uh, hazard analysis or profi uh, profiling. Uh, so I, Analyzing hazards uh, provides uh, more information that uh, disaster management uh, could, uh, could work with. Uh, and uh, these are obviously hazards uh, that are faced uh, by a specific uh, community or country. So uh, these hazard analysis, they are done at, at different levels, because even within one country, I, obviously that applies more to, to bigger countries, but even within one country, different communities can possibly face uh, different disasters. Uh, and that would depend on different uh, factors, but one of them would be, again, uh, physical specific, uh, specificities. Uh, so for example, uh, there would be different um, different disasters, uh, different hazards in the mountains, different uh, close to uh, the coast or uh, or rivers, uh, and it doesn't make sense to have the list because this is very labor intensive. Imagine try to, uh, trying to understand what hazards there could be in one location. It would be a very long list. Uh, so obviously you want to do it specifically uh, for uh, for, the, for certain locations uh, as well as national. Uh, so then the hazards that could potentially affect uh, the whole country, they could be uh, uh, properly uh, addressed. And uh, hazard analysis is followed by uh, risk statements and uh, risk profiles. And now I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what kind of hazards there are. So like I said, a lot of uh, this discipline is systematizing and uh, creating categories of, of hazards uh, helps us uh, to understand their sources and, um, and they also allow to the, the comparison, what is more important, what is uh, what could what could be left alone. Uh, so when we talk about types of hazards, uh, it would be natural hazards. Uh, so at least in theory, uh, these are the kind of hazards uh, that would happen whether we're on the planet or not. Uh, but uh, in many cases, I it is possible or it is actually the case uh, that it's the actions of man, uh, uh, of, of humans, uh, that, um, that make the, the effects uh, worse or even uh, impact the amount of these, uh, of the disasters. 
Uh, so when we're talking about natural hazards, uh, the first category is tectonic. Uh, so that would be associated with the movement of Earth's uh, plates. They're also called uh, seismic hazards. And they occur in, in specific uh, places uh, on Earth. So there are certain locations that are, uh, that are exposed to this kind of hazard and then uh, most of them are not exposed to them at all. And um, here I, I, I gave you links uh, to uh, the National Geographic uh, videos uh, on earthquakes, volcanoes, and tsunamis. Uh, and like I said, this is a very interdisciplinary field. Uh, and uh, geographic knowledge uh, is very useful uh, because it, it helps us understand more about, uh, about natural hazards, especially when it comes to uh, tectonic hazards. So you can, you can watch these, they're very good. They're about five minutes uh, long each. Uh, so here, just a couple of maps uh, of, uh, just to show you the exposure uh, to, so the first one is to earthquakes. Uh, so you can see uh, in Europe, uh, it's just Italy and uh, Greece, and then uh, in Africa, only Algeria. Uh, but then large, uh, large amount of, um, of spaces uh, throughout Asia and uh, Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. And then uh, North America, uh, the US, Mexico, and um, a couple, Colombia and, uh, and Ecuador in, in the South America. And then some Canadian um, territories as well. Uh, and here you have the number of volcanoes. So you can see that some, some areas are exposed, very few, but are exposed uh, to both kind of this kind of, uh, of disaster. So Japan, for example, you can see on both maps uh, the number of earthquakes and uh, volcanoes. Uh, and Italy as well, the number of earthquakes and uh, exposure to volcanoes eruptions as, and Indonesia as well. Uh, so then another category within natural hazards is uh, mass movement. Uh, so this is when large quantities of air, uh, of soil are moving uh, suddenly. Uh, and this includes uh, landslides, uh, debris flows, avalanches, um, expansive soils, land subsidence. And uh, there are two pictures here. Uh, so the first one is from, uh, from Ecuador, from, from the Andes. Uh, and this is, the, this is the kind of hazard that can happen where there are very steep and unstable slopes. So um, we hear every now and then about uh, landslides uh, in India. And then the, the second picture uh, is from Guatemala, a sinkhole in the middle of, of a town. Uh, and this happened because of uh, mining activity. Look at the size of it. Uh, then there are hydrologic uh, hazards. Uh, so the one, uh, the, the kind of hazards that are associated with, uh, with the amount of water. It's either the excess of water or a severe lack of water. And uh, this category includes floods, uh, coastal erosion, soil erosion, drought, and uh, desertification. Uh, and floods are uh, the most common when it comes to natural disasters. And they, on average, cause the most fatalities. So it's around 20,000 uh, per year, but 75 million uh, people affected. And uh, rainfalls uh, are natural. Uh, but then the effects uh, would often have to do with, uh, with human uh, activities. So for example, the unplanned urbanization 
that doesn't allow the water uh, to be absorbed uh, naturally uh, by the by the soil because, for example, there is concrete there now and not uh, not lawns or uh, or the soil. Uh, and when it comes to uh, desertification, it could also be natural or uh, anthropomorphic. Uh, it could come from poor land uh, management, but also from the environmental degradation and, uh, and the, the uh, global warming and, and climate change. And then there are meteorolo meteorological uh, disasters. Uh, and these are related to the weather uh, and uh, are caused by factors related to uh, the, uh, the precipitation, the temperature, the speed of wind, uh, levels of humidity. And the examples include uh, strong winds, like uh, hurricanes, for example, uh, extreme cold or uh, extreme heat. Uh, so you can see we can see this uh, uh, extreme heat uh, situations uh, even in Europe these days. Again, uh, global global warming, wildfires, uh, sandstorms, etc. And then we have uh, natural hazards uh, that are biological and uh, health related, and and this is this is what we're seeing now. I, so viruses uh, would be uh, the type of hazards, the, the type of uh, hazard is biological, uh, our exposure to them and our, uh, uh, how we are affected by, by them. Uh, so biological and health-related health hazards uh, are related to disease in humans, plants or animals. A overall disease is the single greatest cause of death. A, and a, this kind of hazards, uh, or when they happen, this kind of disasters, include uh, human epidemics and pandemics. Uh, so the current situation would be an example. The difference between ep epidemics and pandemics uh, is that um, it's the scale of it. Uh, so. Uh, when it's more isolated and uh, fewer countries are exposed, it would be uh, epidemics or even within a certain area. Uh, but when it becomes global, uh, we call it pandemics. Uh, and also livestock and, uh, and animal uh, epidemics or plant and uh, agricultural epidemics. Uh, so this kind of hazard is often uh, referred to as uh, as a type of hazard that can't be really uh, mitigated uh, or even prepared for. Uh, but here uh, it's uh, an example. It's uh, it's a book by Professor Osterholm where that was published in two thousand and seventeen, uh, and even back then I. He, um, he and, and many other epidemiologists, uh, scientists were fully aware uh, that, uh, that the pandemic like this is just, uh, just a matter of time. Uh, and I, Osterholm actually talks specifically, and remember this, this is published 2017, three years ago. He talks uh, specifically about uh, about a virus that uh, that would affect uh, affect us uh, globally. He talks about pandemics that would come come from China, uh, and that would come from uh, from the wet markets uh, in China. So you can see uh, that the information was there, uh, but uh, for whatever reasons. Uh, governments around the world were not paying attention, and uh, even uh, even when there was uh, information by um, the World Health Organization given in in January this year, 
the the, the pandemic uh, the, the epidemic uh, in in China uh, is serious and it is going to come to other countries uh, and that we need to be prepared only Estonia decided to uh, to order uh, medical kits and you know like the, the, all the basic uh, kind of equipment uh, that the uh, countries started running out of. Uh, it, it's improving now, but you know the, the masks, the um, uh, all the kind of preventive uh, equipment uh, for doctors, not to mention the population. I, there just wasn't enough of it, no, not to mention I, ventilators in the hospital. I, so even though the information was there and I, it was possible to, to get prepared I, and to even mitigate the, the danger, I, nobody has ever has done anything about it really. I, and uh, you can see uh, the video, it's really good. I, I really recommend it. I, I uh, post the, the link here uh, with Professor Osterholm. I, it's an interview from, I, from early March uh, this year I, where he explains what, what we're facing. And this is almost two months now. And I can tell you that everything that he talked about uh, has has happened uh, already, I, and and all of this. This is not uh, just guessing or trying to be impressive. All of it has been researched. He even says that by now, uh, maybe we could have uh, a vaccine because uh, there were two epidemics uh, in the in the last two decades. So there was uh, SARS in 2003 and uh, MERS in 2010, and both, both of these epidemics were coronaviruses. So if we learned our lesson from them, maybe uh, the impact that, uh, that this, uh, this disaster is uh, having on us uh, could, be, uh, could be reduced, if not uh, fully, even like by 50%. Uh, the way uh, the impact of a seasonal flu is reduced by by the vaccines that are uh, that are available. So, like I said, I really really recommend, if not reading the book, uh, then uh, checking out the uh, the YouTube uh, interview. I, so we we talked about natural hazards. So we had biological, meteorological, meteorological a hydrologic mass movement and tectonic. And I, then we can talk about technological hazards. Uh, so these are the negative uh, consequences of uh, human innovation. Uh, and because we're innovating a lot and, and technologies uh, are really developing, uh, there's more and more of possible uh, harm uh, or destruction. Uh, and uh, these hazards can affect life, property, and the environment. They're relatively new because we, we uh, made such progress with, with technology in a relatively uh, short uh, period of time. Uh, so we, we understand them less. We, we don't know as much about them. And for this, for this reason, they could be more difficult uh, to, to, predict, to predict. And because of that, it's not really possible to mitigate them or prepare for them because we don't even know what they could possibly be because some of them have never happened in the past. And um, this is basically a trade-off that we're making between I, between the benefits that we're getting from, uh, from technologies uh, and the risks that are associated uh, with them. Uh, and there's this concept, we're going to talk about it a little bit more uh, soon, of risk acceptability. That uh, we as societies decide uh, that certain things are worth it, uh, even if they might um, be a source of uh, of risks. 
Uh, so I, the first category within technological hazards, transportation. I, so they become common. And there are so many of them happening every day. I, but then we, we only learn about the most spectacular ones. Um, I, the, the transport is hugely important. And I, we, again, we can observe that uh, right now. I, how, how our lives are affected when the transport has to be, global transport has to be, uh, have, have to be stopped. I, it has a huge impact on, on economy, I, on, on, on our social uh, lives, traveling is suddenly not possible, I, industries. I, so this, this became really, really important. And uh, here we're talking about uh, hazards and risks and disasters. I, but then I, in the future, I think uh, disaster managers would consider the transport um, hazards as a secondary hazard of, uh, of a natural hazard of, of a, a pandemic. And maybe, maybe before what, what's happening now, nobody would make this association, but this becomes uh, clear now, uh, that even if there is no transportation disaster, the, the, the lack of transportation coming from the pandemics impact us in a huge way. Um, then infrastructure hazards, and I, these are hazards when it comes to telecommunications and computer network failures, uh, power generation and transmission, transmission uh, water, uh, sewage systems, uh, gas uh, distribution systems, but also food uh, shortages or what we're also facing now overburdened uh, public health and a possible uh, economic uh, failure. Uh, then another technological hazard, um, industrial hazards. So that has to do with our ability to extract, create, produce and provide uh, a lot of goods and services that we depend on. Uh, and this introduced uh, the whole new um, range uh, of hazards. And this includes uh, hazardous uh, materials, processing and uh, storage uh, accidents, and raw materials extraction accidents. And uh, one of the, the most spectacular examples of the uh, Chernobyl, uh, the explosion of the uh, of the nuclear reactors in 1986, and more recently uh, Fukushima uh, in uh, 2011, which was a secondary disaster to uh, to the earthquake, uh, like I earlier explained. Then uh, there is structural fire and structural failure. Uh, hazards uh, as another category of technological uh, hazards. Uh, then we're moving on to uh, another category. Uh, so we had the natural hazards, we had the technological hazards, and here are the uh, intentional, uh, civil or uh, political hazards. Uh, and with with the other hazards, uh, there there is an element of uh, of accidents. Uh, so this could have only be predicted to some extent. Uh, and uh, this kind of hazards uh, they happen uh, not out of accident but intentionally, uh, because of someone's conscious decision to act uh, in a in a certain way. And this is not to say uh, that people who made these, the, these decisions were right or wrong, I, but it is a fact that as a result, uh, societies face uh, hazards. Uh, so many of these are new and emerging, uh, but others have existed as long as, as we've been. Uh, maybe not as long as we've been on this planet, but as long as, as we've 
uh, started uh, organizing um, and from the dawn of our civilizations. And then uh, other international hazards, uh, war, terrorism, uh, stampedes, crime, and uh, civil unrest. So here you can, uh, you can see uh, three main categories of hazards. And then other hazards uh, that uh, wouldn't fit uh, neatly into, into one of these uh, categories. And having them categorized uh, this way, uh, it really helps uh, to, to be able to address them. Uh, not always possible, but at least we have more chance. I, so, I, so hazards, uh, hazards that, that's an important, um, a, an important issue within disaster management. And then another really important one is risk. Uh, so I, on the individual level, I, each person is responsible to, uh, to manage uh, the risks. And, uh, some of the risks are managed, uh, in fact, like some of the individual uh, risks are managed, uh, management of them is obligatory. Uh, so, for example, uh, seat belts and um, in the cars and speed limits, that would be a way of uh, mitigating the risk uh, of uh, driving a car. But then when it comes to risks associated with, for example, uh, extreme sports, we ourselves decide first if uh, we are exposed to that risk at all, and then I, how, I, how we can mitigate it and how we, we can prepare uh, for it uh, potentially. I, so, uh, risk protection techniques would be to, uh, to reduce the, the vulnerability. So that's on, on an individual level. And then uh, there, is the, uh, there, there are risks that, are, that we're facing collectively. Uh, and they are usually uh, large scale hazards. And uh, even though Overall, they result in, uh, in fewer injuries and, and fatalities and, um, uh, and um, loss and damages. I, they are considered uh, significant because if they happen, I, the, the impact is massive. Uh, so this kind of, uh, of risks have to be, uh, are the responsibility of governments, uh, basically. Uh, so it's the government's uh, responsibility uh, to manage and uh, and to guide uh, these risk uh, management. And then, if the the disaster happens, it is also the responsibility of the governments uh, to respond uh, and uh, then uh, aid in uh, in the recovery. Uh, and this is again, this is uh, what is happening now. So you can see that all governments are responding uh, to a disaster that, uh, that happened. They also uh, try to, uh, to mitigate, uh, mitigate uh, hazards that can follow, uh, economic, uh, social, or, uh, or political. And it's really fascinating to look at how different uh, states approach uh, this very same um, issue. Uh, so in most countries, uh, it's been uh, the lockdown. So uh, the risk of getting sick have been reduced by, uh, by um, containing uh, our social interactions, uh, our business. Uh, but then in Sweden, for example, uh, they did not do the lockdown at the scale uh, as, as the other countries uh, did to, to keep going with their uh, economy. Uh, and it was possible there uh, because it's a very specific type of a society uh, where there's a lot of trust between the society and, uh, and the leaders. So instead of 
imposing a lockdown, uh, the government in Sweden asked uh, people if if they could be responsible in this situation and limit the the social uh, contact as much uh, as much as possible. But they they didn't ban a certain type of contact. So, for example, the cinemas. I'm not sure now actually, but a, a couple of weeks ago, the cinemas would still be open. They would allow only twenty people. Uh, but they were open and same uh, with cafes and um, and different type of classes. Uh, so uh, that doesn't mean that Swedish government was not responsible. Uh, it's just the specifics of the society that allowed uh, the, the lockdown to be uh, to be less severe. And then you have the example of the UK, for example, uh, where it was just a irresponsibility and same uh, in, in the US uh, of the leaders who the difference was that in Sweden there was no lockdown I but they were getting prepared uh, for the increased number of cases I they uh, they opened these temporary hospitals they made sure that uh, they have enough equipment enough masks that doctors are paid more in this period uh, so they they stayed uh, motivated. In the UK, uh, there were no measures taken at all. Uh, the assumption was that uh, there was a, the herd immunity uh, concept, which, which turned out not to be true. In the US, it was oh, it's nothing. It's it's just like a flu. Uh, so really, really interesting. To, to see how different governments uh, deal, uh, deal with disasters, uh, have dealt with disasters, uh, with, with this particular uh, biological disaster, uh, the pandemic. And then when we're talking about uh, risks, we have to consider likelihood and the consequence. Uh, so basically, how likely is an event and what uh, are uh, the possible uh, consequences? Uh, and again, it's important to define this because uh, confusion could be avoided if we understand uh, what, uh, what, risks, uh, what a risk is. Uh, so the likelihood uh, is based on the historical information, uh, but also, like for example, with the case of pandemic, I, not so much the historical information, al although a little bit, but careful observation of what is uh, what are the developments um, currently. I, so, like I like uh, the book by Osterholt. Uh, so understanding what um, what risks uh, these wet markets create and that it it is likely uh, that the, uh, the virus would spread and then the consequences are massive. So it should have been a, a risk that uh, that should have been thought of as, as very uh, serious, but was not. Uh, so when we talk about consequences, um, what needs to be weighted is uh, the effect of, uh, of this risk on humans, uh, infrastructure, uh, and the environment. There are three factors, so from three points of view, uh, in terms of that uh, and fatalities. Uh, injuries and then damages and losses uh, and uh, it could also be uh, the consequences could also be grouped based on the effects and these could be direct uh, so uh, what we see immediately like fatalities injuries the cost of repair loss of business uh, cleanup costs or indirect uh, like, for example, loss of income, uh, or what we're also uh, observing now, a reduction of, uh, of spending, then all the so, uh, psychosocial impacts as well. Uh, and then 
The effects could also be tangible uh, and cause of repair or response cost would uh, be in this group or intangible. So they would be culture impact, stress, even mental illness that is associated uh, with the disaster, but is an intangible effect of it. Uh, then the risks could be grouped as intensive, extensive and emerging. And this is important because when disaster managers have their list of hazards and then they're calculating uh, the risks, uh, not all risks uh, actually have to be addressed uh, because they either are not very serious uh, or um, they are not very likely and the consequences are low. So, uh, so the reality of it is that they, they have to be a lot of choices uh, made. Uh, so intensive uh, disaster is uh, the kind that has great consequences, but it's not that likely. Then extensive, extensive is a disaster that happened uh, that happened a lot. Uh, well, not not a disaster actually, an event, an event that happens a lot, but then uh, the consequences are relatively low. So even though there is a certain risk associated. Uh, the risk might not be addressed in the process of uh, disaster management. And then there are emerging uh, hazards, uh, emerging risks. Uh, so uh, there is a sudden change uh, in either likelihood uh, or, or consequence. Uh, so then you have all the hazards listed, you have them analyzed, you have the then uh, risks uh, risks listed and um, and uh, then they need to be evaluated. Uh, so the disaster manager at at this stage has to decide uh, uh, has to rate these uh, these uh, risks. What is more serious and what is less serious? What needs to be addressed and uh, what what doesn't really. I have to. Uh, and in many cases, uh, there is technology existing uh, to mitigate certain risks, but um, it's so expensive that the countries wouldn't decide to go for it. And a good example would be uh, providing uh, electricity. Uh, so having electricity overground creates a certain amount of risk. It might not be huge, but there is a certain uh, risk associated with it. Uh, and um, burying uh, the cables would, uh, would almost remove the risk, but it's 10 times more expensive to have the, the wires buried than to have them overground. So, uh, so countries usually decide to keep them. Actually, I'm not sure if there are any cases of burying uh, wires because it's so expensive. So, uh, for the risk evaluation to be conducted, hazards have to be identified, described, mapped, and analyzed. Um, like I said, not all risks require immediate or uh, any action. I, and sometimes I, there is a direct correlation. So for example, usually in the communities where there are a lot of firefighters, uh, the impact of fires uh, would be much lower because there are services in place uh, that would reduce this, um, uh, this, this risk. But in many cases, there, the, the potential ways of mitigating uh, are many uh, and then others are really really expensive uh, to achieve even the uh, slight reductions so all this is what um, what the disaster management manager has to think of and then when it comes to risk evaluation uh, other factors are uh, risk acceptability uh, risk perception and uh, risk benefits and uh, risk acceptability is a, that's a really interesting uh, issue. So uh, 
I mentioned that before, but basically I, we decide that certain, I, um, certain things are worth it, are worth uh, the risk. And this is, again, really fascinating to look at uh, from the perspective of what is happening now. So to reduce uh, the risk of getting uh, infected, we decide to accept certain political, uh, social, personal, and economic uh, risks. Uh, so economically, obviously, the fact uh, that uh, the economy slowed down so much that businesses had to uh, close down, uh, even if temporarily, that's an economic risk that we decide to take because we want to stay healthy. Uh, and then, uh, political risks, I, the fact that our rights I, are, are really uh, con contained uh, and I, how much of it are we, uh, are we ready uh, to accept at, and at, some, at what point people would say enough. Uh, and then social as well. So in the US, for example, you have these protests against the lockdown. So obviously they decide that taking these economic risks uh, is, is, it's, it's worth it. I, or they, they perceive, and that's another factor, the risk perception. They don't perceive the, the risk of getting infected uh, as so serious. I, and I used to live in, in uh, Ireland for, for many years. In Ireland, uh, for the last few days, the main issue has been uh, that the pubs would be closed uh, for a year and a half or two years. It seems like this is when they, uh, when they start to crack. Uh, it's so important in their culture that uh, it, it's obviously they, they didn't go out to, to protest about it, but it seems like this is really an issue. This is a social risk that they are not willing uh, to take an economic as well. Uh, here you have uh, a case study uh, of, of risk avoidance, so I'll, I'll just leave you to read it in your own time. Uh, and then the last concept that I wanted to talk about is uh, vulnerability. Uh, so what is important here is that uh, vulner vulnerability is not the same uh, as uh, exposure. Uh, so, uh, the different countries could be exposed to the exact same hazard, but they are, they are not as vulnerable uh, when it comes to, to impact. So, a good example would be a drought uh, in Spain and in Ethiopia. Uh, the same type of hazard happens every year but the vulnerability in Spain is much lower than the vulnerability uh, in Ethiopia. And this is for a number of factors, and these include uh, physical, social, economic, and environmental uh, factors. Uh, and <coughs> uh, vulnerability has an impact on uh, weighing, uh, weighing the, uh, the risks. And they dictate uh, the, what the consequences uh, are, whether they are increased or, or decreased. So the exposure can be quite high, but then the consequence, uh, the, the actual vulnerability, uh, can be can be low. And uh, vulnerability, like I said, could depend on the physical profile. I, when it comes to physical profile, is a combination of uh, geography, infrastructure, and people. I, and when it comes to assessing uh, the risk, uh, these three components, the more we know about them, the better we understand them, the, the more we can understand uh, the vulnerability. I, and each of these hazards, uh, each of these components contribute to uh, the hazards and how likely they are to occur uh, and how the consequences uh, will manifest themselves. Then the social profile. 
Uh, so depending on uh, on the characteristics of the uh, society, uh, basically, uh, the vulnerability could be higher uh, or lower. Uh, and again, the example of Sweden uh, and, and the UK. So in Sweden, it was possible uh, to not have the lockdown uh, because uh, the social trust is is really high. The the social trust in the communities, uh, but also between the, the leaders and the society. Uh, so, uh, Swedish government could ex could trust their citizens that if they say we advise you to be really careful, uh, that that people will uh, will observe that. Uh, and uh, then in the UK, I, it, what, what happened really shows that uh, people uh, really rely on their, on their government and uh, they need to be told specifically uh, what, what, uh, what to do. And only if a, a statement, a clear statement is made, I, they would be ready to comply. Uh, then the environmental profile. So obviously, uh, vulnerability would depend on um, on some environmental characteristics. So if they would be different in the mountains and different by the coast, uh, for example. So for for example, when we come when we talk about natural hazards, uh, earthquake, uh, it would um, and, and the exposure to tsunami that comes after that it will be different on the coast different uh, different in the mountains I, and this could be used by disaster managers uh, to uh, in the in the response uh, to disasters so in japan because the earthquakes happen all the time uh, people know that if they feel uh, that something is happening they need to start moving to to the hills of say Tokyo uh, and they have to trust that wh wherever their loved ones are they are also starting to moving uh, starting to move to these uh, higher places in case a tsunami happen that everybody is uh, is safer because ju just for the simple fact that they are higher uh, and then the economic profile so basically the more resources, uh, the the better uh, the response could be. In theory, it's it's not guaranteed because it's it's really depending on uh, on the decisions on uh, of how the resources are allocated. I, but I, the financial financial well being could uh, be uh, a measure. Well, could, yeah, could be a measure of uh, of the country's ability uh, to to protect themselves. Okay. Uh, and this brings us uh, to the end. Uh, so disasters affected humans uh, since uh, we showed up on this planet, uh, but a systematic and comprehensive uh, way of thinking uh, and addressing uh, disasters. Uh, disasters uh, started after the Second World uh, War and uh, really started taking shape in the 1970s, uh, the 1970s and 1980s, uh, and then at the international level, it was the 90s when it started to be addressed. Uh, then, what is really, really important is the four-phase uh, approach. So not just the response and recovery, so not just how we react when the disaster happens and how we recover afterwards, but the fact that we're trying to prepare and to mitigate as, as much as, uh, as possible. So then uh, these measures allow to, uh, to de decrease the, the vulnerability. Uh, and uh, to manage disasters, Hazards and risks have to be identified, identified and carefully analyzed. I, and then I, the, 
the field of disaster management in is interdisciplinary uh, and the cooperation within it uh, is really crucial. So that's that's all from me. Thank you. Uh, do you have any questions? No, I think no, everything was clear. Okay, I'm glad. So thank you very much for watching. And I, I'm going to, uh, this was recorded, so I, it will be uh, posted on uh, on some Sun's uh, website. I really, rec uh, I really uh, recommend checking out these, uh, these links uh, that I put on the slides. Uh, they're very interesting materials. Yes, I know this. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.